I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty, so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Sanyang Gatso, the drunken Dalai Lama. Who was Sanyang Gyatso? He was the sixth Dalai Lama, born in the late 17th century. He died at only 24 years old. However, despite his short reign, he spent his tenure partying, drinking, and seeing the ladies of the night, and ultimately rejecting his religious duties. His actions led to shadowy assassination plots, kidnappings, foreign invasions, imposters being installed on the throne, claiming to be the true Dalai Lama, and nearly destroying the core religious beliefs of Tibetan Buddhism. He was the Buddhist Andrew W.K. Act 1. Nothing says religious leader like sex workers and alcoholism. Who is Sangyang Gyatso, the sixth Dalai Lama? Sangyang Gyatso was born in 1683 in a deeply troubled period of Tibetan history. To understand his role in everything we are going to discuss tonight, we must first analyze his predecessor and Tibetan-Chinese relations at the time. Tibet and Imperial China have had a tenuous history dating back to the Chinese invading Tibet since the Tang Dynasty. The Mongol Empire under Kublai Khan, grandson of the Great Khan, Genghis, conquered Tibet in 1244 AD, making Tibet a vassal state under Khanate protection. Believe it or not, the Tibetan Lamas, their high priests and head monks, converted Mongolians to Tibetan Buddhism. There, the Tibetan Lamas served as spiritual advisors to the Mongolian court. By 1644, a new imperial Chinese dynasty came about, Qing Dynasty. The Qing Emperor called upon the fifth Dalai Lama in 1648 to enter an alliance to get the Tibetans to exert influence over the Mongolians to prevent any future invasions from the Mongolians. The fifth Dalai Lama established some important religious edicts that are still impacting today's modern Chinese Tibetan politics. He set up the Panchen Lama to oversee one administrative region of Tibet. While it weakened the Dalai Lama's total control over the country, the Panchen serves as the number two in Tibetan clerical hierarchy under the Dalai Lama. The Chinese government has used the Panchen Lama to divide the Tibetan people and gain further control for centuries. So I'm picturing the Panchen Lama as the Bib Fortuna of Tibetan religious figures. Now use a different metaphor to explain that metaphor. <laughs> it's kind of fascinating to me that the Dalai Lama is a concept that just exists, period. Like it's a it's 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 really interesting to me that there is this idea that there is a spiritual leader that is divinely reincarnated. And, and when one dies, another, you know, that that same person is reincarnated in a different body and you know, the, the kind of like apparatus of the religious organization has to go out and find that child and then bring them back. And they're like raised from birth to be, you know, ostensibly the, the religious thought leader of a, an entire culture. That's way cooler to me than like, all right, a bunch of cardinals get together and then they all, you know, backstab each other. And then one of them goes, ah, that guy, he's going to be the religious fucking leader and everyone's like yes god god has ordained that guy to be the leader instead of just you know the political backstabbings of the catholic church one of the longest running criminal organizations on the on the planet yeah i mean there's something there's something very romantic about the idea that it's it's steeped in this sort of like um this this universal uh process of reincarnation that it's like you said that it's not it's not it's not um I mean, underneath everything, it is political, but it's the way it's sort of like treated is not a political process. It's it's a process steeped very directly because, you know, like the, the Catholic Church is a religion, but and they have obviously a lot of beliefs that are steeped in religion. But the way that they function is very much just a political organization. It, it, it's that's what it really is. It's a it's a it's a like a political organization crossed with one of this, the most successful Ponzi schemes in history like it's so successful they have their own country like the Vatican is a literal nation state because they've just been so big they've just been they've just amassed so much wealth that they've managed to be like oh what if we just pay everybody off around us and then we just are autonomous hmm? work for everybody else cool yeah but this is this is a theocracy that is very literally um uh executed steeped in a religious process the idea that 
there is a just a agreed upon um continuity within this theocracy that the leader is going to be like a like a spiritual reincarnation of the previous leader it like i that that's just like you said it's just it's just a lot more interesting than like and then we go into a room and we have a discussion and then some smoke comes out of a chimney and then the pope comes out and he's the new pope and that pope may or may not look like emperor palpatine and may or may not literally be a former hitler youth just saying just saying it may it might not happen that way but it also uh might definitely it might not happen but it very likely will just just going to be up front with you it's probably going to be that it's probably going to be a guy who has at least tangentially been involved in uh, protecting known child rapists and uh, moving them all around the world so that they can keep their positions of wealth and, uh, and uh, you know, a social hierarchy. But uh, we just want them to repent and turn over a new leaf. It's not their fault that they diddled kids. It's, it's really not. What is more interesting and unusual is the fifth Dalai Lama's death and how the Tibetan government managed it, which led us to the situation of the sixth Dalai Lama. In 1682, the fifth Dalai Lama died. The Tibetan government did not want the Qing dynasty to invade, and so they hid this death from the Qing officials. Every time Qing officers came to meet with the Dalai Lama, they said he was sequestered in meditation and could not be seen. This was kept up for 14 to 15 years. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, yeah. Um, He's uh, he's meditating. Well, the last time I was here, he was also meditating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but he's just he's still meditating. How, how about I come back when he's not meditating? Yeah, but here's the thing. Um, He's going to be meditating for the next 14 to 15 years. Does that work for you? Uh, hey, um, hey guys, uh, we're back. Oh, oh, th- this is crazy. This is nuts. You are not going to believe me when I tell you this. Let me guess. He's, he's, he's meditating. What can I say? He's, he's the, he's the doll. He's the llama. He's, th- that's his thing. Llama's going to do like llama's going to do. He be meditating, bro. Bro, have you ever meditated? No, man, I'm not really into that. I'm more like a clerical dude who's like here on behalf of the Qing uh, dynasty to like make sure you guys are like, you know, on the up and up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, have you ever tried Tatin? You done that Tatin? Because when you're in a good Tate, sometimes you just want to Tate for like 14, 15 years. 14, 15 years. All right. Uh, We're here to see the llama. And before you say anything, we sent somebody ahead. They came, they met with your, uh, the, the guy at the front, the front office guy, and he said that he was meditating, but that he would be done in about 15 days. So I timed it out so I would get here exactly at 15 days. So he should be out by now. Who told you that? Was that, was that Jeff that told you that? Okay, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry, but like our old front desk guy, we had to let him go. And he put in it, he was doing his two weeks, but he was a little, he was a little disgruntled. He was a little bitter. And so he just started like lying to people. Like anybody who came, he would just say like the opposite of the truth to them. I'm really sorry that you wasted your time, but yeah, he's, he's, he's Tatin right now. Like full, he's full Tate. He's full Larry Tate. Darren's boss from Bewitched, Larry Tate. Just come back, uh, in like, I don't know. 14 to 15 years, maybe? That sounds like a, that's like, that sounds like a good round number. Let's just say come back in 14 to 15 years and we'll be good. I know that you seem really angry right now. I know that you seem irate because you feel like you're being purposefully shifted around this labyrinthian bureaucracy of different, you know, kind of multi-leveled, uh, you know, kind of monk guys. And, you know, we're all kind of are just like sending you to different monk departments trying to, you know, make it hard for you. But that's not what we're doing. We're here to help you. We have seen that your blood pressure is high, your cholesterol is high, and quite frankly, bro, you look like you used some Tatin. You tried Tatin? It'll really, really help you. Listen, I got some advice for you. I can. This job looks like it's causing you undue stress. 
I don't like this for you. I think that you need to take a roughly 14 to 15 year sabbatical. Have you ever thought about becoming a Tibetan monk here? You could just like live here with us and never return to your life. Uh, It's really easy. We just kind of hang out, do some chores, meditate, tapen, if you will. And then uh, just reach like higher planes of enlightenment. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, okay, so if I did do that, if I did stay here, then then I would be able to see the Dalai Lama because I would be here, and whenever he comes out, I'll be around. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You could totally see him in like 14, 15 years. This is this is this was like a literal. This was like a weekend at Bernie's scenario. Like for for fifteen years, they were just like. He, look, he's dancing, guys. The Dalai Lama's dancing. They just keep shit like they're all at a party and there's like a bunch of dudes there from the Qing dynasty trying to have a meeting with him. And he's like across the room, like in a chair and all you can see is the back of his head. And then like they they worm their way through the party to get over there. And then they look and now he's on the other side of the party and they have to like, you know, conga line through a bunch of people to get over there. Grumpy, you know, it's the the fucking 17th century or 16th century whatever whatever time period we're in uh equivalent of like a grumpy businessman you know god we're just here trying to see the fucking we're just trying to see the fucking dalai lama i know man but have you like have you tried the like dumplings they're really good man just try these fucking dumplings after you eat these dumplings you're gonna wanna take a 14 to 15 year nap bro bro (laughs) I'm not going to say that these dumplings are running through me, but they're kind of running through me. I'm going to go take a shit for like 14, 15 years. You want to come? You want to come? It's just right over here. You want to come take a 14, 15 year shit? Come on. It's just over here. Come on. Come on. Ah, yeah, you. Come on. Find the sixth guy. Find the sixth guy. Like, I, I yeah, I, I love, I love this. I love, I like, you, you can't write this. I mean, you can write this. But you, yeah, you can, and they did, but then it got rewritten into Weekend at Bernie's. Yes. That would be so funny. And you know how there's those movies that, like, you don't realize that they actually are, like, based on something like, oh, like, everyone's like, oh, yeah, The Lion King is, is, is a retelling of Hamlet. And then, <laughs> and like, but nobody, nobody <laughs> realizes. Weekend at Bernie's is a retelling of this? <laughs> yeah, nobody realizes it. But Weekend at Bernie's is, like, a, is a weird retelling of, of the six Dalai Lama story. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew McCarthy is the sixth Dalai Lama. If you read the credits at the very end, it says like, thank you to the Tibetan people for their time and resources in this uh, endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> Directed by the 14th Dalai Lama. <laughs> I would love if there was a Dalai Lama who was just like, you know, I kind of just want to like direct some movies. You say that, but as we go on, that's kind of exactly what this is. Like, not too bad. It's It really is, right? It kind of is. People were told that the Great Fifth was continuing his long retreat. On important occasions, the Dalai Lama's ceremonial gown was placed on the throne. However, when Mongol princes insisted on having an audience, an old monk called Depa Dayrab of the Namgyal Monastery, who resembled the Dalai Lama, was hired to pose in his place. He wore a hat and an eye shade to conceal the fact that he lacked the Dalai Lama's piercing eyes. There's many great things about that. Number one, I love the idea that these these princes are like, I would like, bring me to the Dalai Lama, please. And then they bring him and they're like, hmm. And they're standing there and they're like, where are your piercing eyes? Usually when I meet the Dalai Lama, he eye fucks me and make and just I I just want to I want to I want to do some things with the Dalai Lama that I just never in my time period would ever think was acceptable. But I'm not feeling that right now. Your eyes, they're not getting me there. They're not taking me to that place. I love the idea that there was like a developmental meeting where they were like, they're like a solid decade in. Like they've been hiding this for a decade. And then somebody comes up with the idea of using a body double and Depa Dayrab of the Namgyal Monastery is like there visiting just to like hang out. And they're like, you know, Depa kind of looks like how the great fifth used to look may his departed soul rest in whatever forever or re re found re reincarnated find whatever they don't believe in an afterlife so like that'd be really cool be really cool if he would like help us and then he like walks over and another monk is like yeah he doesn't really have piercing eyes though and then the first monk is like yeah but like what if we just put a hat on him and then that worked 
<laughs> That's what's the best part about it is that it worked. Deppa looks like the Dalai Lama and like, yeah, you know, I see it. But the thing is, is that he's not sexy enough. Yeah. You know, I don't really look at Deppa and like get aroused, you know, like his eyes don't just instantly make me like, but like, maybe we can hide that. Maybe if we just like put one of those poker, green poker visors, that'll just like, no, that they didn't have those in the 16th century. All right. Maybe if we just like, what if we put him in like, um, like, uh, I don't know. Let's go with a Oakland athletics baseball cap. What if we just put, no, we don't have those either in this time period. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, what about a novelty Disneyland Darth Vader mask? No. Ah, oh, fuck, man. What kind of headgear do we got? Oh, we've got like, uh, large hats that have little dangly things on the front that hide their eyes. Perfect. Let's use that. This almost has like a Smithers, Mr. Burns dynamic to it. Where, like, they they find the guy, like, this guy looks just like the Dalai Lama. Like, it'll be perfect. We can use him as a body double. We can get away with this. We'll be fine. And the one guy's like, yeah, but his, his, he doesn't have his piercing eyes, though. He doesn't have, he doesn't have those piercing eyes. And the other guys are like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you know, the Dalai Lama's famously piercing eyes, those, those eyes that just like look at, as if they're looking into your soul and yet looking through you at the same time. And that they, in that moment, nobody understands you more than this person does and that you will never meet another person that understands you on this level ever again. And every time you leave his gaze, you forget what it's like to be loved. But then whenever you re-enter his gaze, you suddenly remember that being loved is the greatest single experience that the human body can ever have. And they're just like, uh, yeah, that is a thing that we all feel when we see him. Uh, put a lampshade on his head. <laughs> then they have like a they have like a 1980s movie montage of like trying different hats on, you know. Everybody to keep get it the Dalai Lama and I won't. This time might be hard to handle like faith were. And then, the, and then Deppa comes out and he's like, and they're like, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. 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 My, my theme song would be like the nineties sitcom called, uh, Deppa Don't Know about. It's an adaptation of this story, but with the key twist that Depa Dayrab of the Namyong Monastery doesn't know that he's not the Dalai Lama. So they're using him as a pawn. Oh, I thought he, I thought it was going to be that, like, he doesn't know that they're just trying to use him as a as a body double. He thinks that they just like think he's cool. And it's like a she's all that thing where at the end of the movie, somebody lets it slip. And he's like, wait a minute. All this time. You just wanted me to be a body double for the Dalai Lama. You didn't just want to be with me for me. And then the one guy's like, no, that's not true. It, it started out that way. But then I realized that your eyes were piercing. <laughs> Global instability and uh, interregional strife mean nothing to me now. I love you, Deppa. I don't mind spending every day in the summer, in the pouring rain. And I will be loved. And I will be loved. That's them spinning around. I don't know if you got that, but they're, they're, they're in the rain and they're, they're clasping hands and they're spinning. Yeah, but the opening to every episode is like, it's a, it's like a visual reminder of the setup that like, they're, that he's not the Dalai Lama, but they're hiding that he's the Dalai Lama. So it's just all these montages of him being goofy and like thinking people like him, but he's actually like being manipulated. So there's like the hat trying on montage. And every time he's like turning to camera, freeze frame, smiling. And then, you know, directed by starring. So this, this show is like a, a combination between Weekend at Bernie's or any of those weird high concept comedies from the 80s and then like an 80s high concept rom-com like um, just one of the guys where like somebody goes through a transformation and then they think that somebody likes them but then they find out at the end that they were actually being tricked as part of a bet or like some kind of scheme or, you know, like a global shadow plot to uh, defraud and uh, preserve interregional uh, warfare from not breaking out between the Chinese 
and uh, Tibet. Yes, and then like, and then like, like full house, and then like. Well, in the first season, uh, Depa Darab was played by Mary Kate and Ashley. Oh yeah, yeah. During this fourteen-year period, they were searching for the Dalai Lama's reincarnation, and they found Sang Yang Gyatso. Sang Yang was born on March first, sixteen eighty-three, in Mon Tawang, which is in modern-day India now. Rumors reached the monks that a boy had, quote, remarkable abilities. Listen, I saw him. He has remarkable abilities. What, like, what, what does that mean? Like, what, what, like, what? They're remarkable. Oh, sick. So he could, like, make stuff levitate or, like, predict the future or, like, heal people? No, it's like, it's just kind of like when you, when you, like, when you say something to him that you think is going to go over his head because he's 13, he, like, gives, like, an oddly, like, precocious response that you're just not expecting. Like, you'll just be like, you'll learn about it when you're older, kid, and then he'll be like, really? Because I think I know more about it than you do. Like, it's stuff like that. Oh, so you mean, like, he's wise beyond his years. Like, he really, truly is the reincarnation of the previous Dalai Lama. No, it's not really that. It's not, like, he doesn't have any kind of, like, wisdom. It's just, like, he's just, like, a little sassy. It's just endearing, you know? How do the monks know a person is the reincarnation of someone? According to Tibetan Buddhism, the spirit of the Dalai Lama is reincarnated into the body of his successor at the moment of his death. When the current Dalai Lama, the 14th, was born, a rainbow appeared over his house and that was taken as one of the signs. Typically, a search party is sent out in disguise to the rumored reincarnation and is tested to see if the child knows the party members. The 14th Dalai Lama, Lamo Dantup, also passed the test of correctly picking out which items belonged to his predecessor between a rosary, small drum, and a walking stick. He took the rosary and repeated the Buddhist mantra, Om Mane Padme Hum. So basically, every high concept 80s comedy was just based on Tibetan history. Like they coined every quirky high concept 80s plot. I mean, I'm a big fan of the movie At Rainbow's End um, about a young Lisa Kudrow traveling across the country to find a reincarnated uh, Sean Penn. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't Lisa know. Kudrow? What? what, what? Why Why her? I don't know. I think I saw something about Romy and Michelle's high school reunion earlier today on the internet, and I guess she just popped into my head. I don't know. In 1688, a boy was brought to Lhasa to be tested to see if he was the reincarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama. The fifth Panchen Lama, Lobsong Yeshi, administered the vows of a novice monk and was given the name Siang Yang Gyatso. In October 1697, Siang Yang was enthroned as the sixth Dalai Lama at the age of 14. The sixth would regularly rebel against the religious rules he had to follow. He dressed as a layman and took the name Norsang Wangpo to get drunk and visit brothels throughout his teenage years. So, like, still, 80s movie plot after 80s movie plot. He turns 14, he becomes Dalai Lama, and he's like, yeah, 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 I hear all this stuff you're talking about, about, like, spiritual leader, enlightenment, reincarnation, meditation... I was like, what do you call it? Tatin? Tatin? That's lame. I'm not going to call it Tatin. I ain't Tatin. I ain't fucking Tatin. I'm hating that Tatin. I'm hating that Tatin. But you know what I am liking? I'm liking that master Baton. Into <laughs> Baton. Not into Tatin. Uh, where are them brothels at, man? I'm trying to get, uh, I'm trying to get tugged. What's going on? I'm in, I'm, I ain't into the Tatin. Hating the Tatin, liking the Baton, would prefer to go to a brothel for the Relatin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. you guys want me to like meet with some fucking guys from china or something yeah i'm happy to do that uh after you take me to them prostitute where, where can i get some of them chots try to find some of them chots all right, all right. Where, what is it? Who? Where's the guy? The, it's these guys over here. All right, well, hold on. Let me just do this real quick. Oh, hey. Uh, I saw a vision. Um, we have to conquer that country. All right. Uh, where's where's the? Take me to the toots. Trying to get some toots, man. Ain't about them tates. Trying to get some. Not having to ever bait again. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> God, I, this guy is insufferable. Why did the fifth Dalai Lama get reincarnated into this? God, fifth Dalai Lama? That guy was all right. This dude? This dude fucking sucks, bro. This is the worst reboot of Doctor Who ever. Hate the Tate, like the bait, would like to relate with some toots on a date. <laughs> <laughs> This 
This is so stupid. And yet, factually, what actually happened? At 19 or 20, reports are conflicting, he completely renounced his monastic vows, left the imperial palace, and moved into a small apartment in the capital, Lhasa. His abdication threw Tibetan politics into a total tailspin because Tibetan politics was governed by the divine right to rule. By saying that the reincarnation was wrong, then that would throw the legitimacy of the entire theocratic state into question. The Tibetan people still viewed him as a true reincarnation, but just that his actions were, quote, too subtle to be, quote, viewed. And it's interesting because, you know, you, you there's a lot of built-in kayfabe to the idea where you are saying that every leader that is chosen is a reincarnation of the previous leader and that they're going to be the leader for their entire life until they die. Um, and at which point they will be replaced by somebody else. Um, you know, that's not like a president or where, you know, they're, they are, uh, uh, elected in, in intervals or even like a King who is supposed to rule for their life, but they could be overthrown. There's no, there's no built in logic to it that says that the king has to be the king regardless. It wouldn't break the logic of the system if the king died or was overthrown or something like that. It would just be like, oh, shit, like that sucks um, or that's great. But the fact that like this whole system hinges on this idea that these people are divinely chosen. It's a wonder that this never happened again before or since like the idea that this guy was just like he was chosen to become this actor in this system. And then he was just like, fuck this. Like, I don't want to do this bullshit. I'm going to go write some poems, motherfucker. And then it just like broke their whole system. Like it's crazy that that never happened again or never happened before. Once they have committed to saying this person is the reincar reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, you can't overthrow that. Like they are it and they're supposed to be it forever. And the idea that he would just be like, fuck this, it like it breaks it. And then they have to then they're, they're like, what? oh, shit. Like, what do we do now? Like we got to figure out how to explain why this guy is like an asshole and like wants to leave. Yeah, he's kind of the Charlie Sheen of of uh <laughs> Dalai Lamas. Yeah. And and but yeah, it's just it's crazy to me that that just isn't a thing that has happened before or since really. And I guess the reason for that is because most people would be would be more than happy to assume that power and keep it forever. Like it's probably you're probably hard pressed to find somebody who's just like nah i'm good i don't need to like be the leader of this this whole nation and like have un and like just be weighted on hand and foot for the rest of my life but this guy for whatever reason did he was just like eh, eh i did it for a couple years wasn't for me sang yang's poems he wrote chiefly talked about all the ladies he liked to see from courtesans to the beer girls he met in the market while he lived in his small apartment he apparently wore blue silk robes and grew out his hair in long braids sang yang spent his days doing archery drinking and singing love songs in various taverns there is a popular belief that the taverns sang yang visited and consecrated his time in were later painted yellow to show he spent time there also the big lebowski was based on this story so so here so as we just said our boy Sang Yang was a, was a bit of a poet. He just had a he had a he had a he had a vision for what his life was going to be. Man, he didn't want to be this fucking religious leader. He wanted to be a poet. Yeah, and that's what whenever whenever earlier whenever you were like, oh, what if like a Dalai Lama just like quit to direct movies? That's literally what this is. Like <laughs> that, that's literally what he did. Like in back in this time, there was no such thing as movies. The rock stars were like art artists, like painters and classical musicians and poets and people who would go around just being bards and shit like he literally did that but uh we have we have some of these poems that that, that dave's gonna read right now poem one when the fortune god smiles at me i hoist a fortune bringing flag then i am invited to the feast by a girl with beautiful legs art art Honestly, we 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 talked a lot of shit about poetry in the Bella Thorne episode, and I expressed my extreme my extreme dubiousness about anybody calling themselves a poet. But this is this I get the girl of the marketplace and I made that true love knot. I did not try to untie it. It untied of its own accord. You know, what that means 
He wasn't doing no baiting. He wasn't doing no tating. He was relating. He was relating. He was relating in toot dating. A love met in passing. Girl with the fragrant limbs. Like finding rare turquoise and throwing away. Lady, a lord's daughter. When I saw such a peach, she was like a ripe fruit in the topmost branches. This is... This is some juicy stuff. The context here is using the fruit peach has cultural significance at this moment in time. And it insinuates that when he said, when I saw such a peach, he was referring to like a high class royalty person. Whereas when Steve Miller was saying, I really love your peaches, I'd like to shake your tree. You know, he was talking about some neighborhood girl like you like that didn't have that didn't have that didn't mean that he was talking about like a princess. That just meant like, you know, Susie from down the street. Actually, the Steve Miller band didn't even actually write those lyrics. That was actually an interpolation of a song called Lovey Dovey by a band called the Clovers in the 50s. But uh, I-, I doubt they were talking about a princess either. If the girl doesn't die, the beer will never stop. Indeed, I can name her a young man's safe haven. Frozen ground, surface slips, no place to send a horse, a lover newly caught. It is no place for heart to talk. I mean, these are just Panic of the Disco lyrics at this point. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. This 17th century Tibet has informed all culture. They created 80s rom-coms. They created high concept comedies. They created early 2000s emo Dance, dance, we're falling in love to have sex like the seventh Dalai Lama. Frozen ground, surface slips, no place to send a horse. A lover newly caught is no place for hard talk with a bit of latent with some two dates. Frozen ground, surface slips, no place to send a horse. A lover newly caught, no. <laughs> When the ground god smiles at me, I host a fortune bringing flag and then I am invited to the feast with a girl with a beautiful leg. When we went in to do this episode, I don't think anybody expected. I mean, we might have expected we were going to, un- uh, you know, talk about an interesting story about history, about this time in, in history in this area of the world. But nobody expected that we were going to uncover the greatest discovery of all time that all semi-modern Western culture all came from this 15-year period in, in Tibet in the 1600s. Seng Yang had earned many enemies for his flaunting of religious and stately duties, and this would have disastrous consequences for Tibet, leading to the country being invaded by Mongolia and China, and setting the stage for the modern situation of Chinese claim to total control over Tibet that it finds itself in today. Hey everybody, this is Spandrew, and we've got a pretty exciting thing to announce. To commemorate the two-year anniversary of Deep Cuts and the return of the show, we've put together something pretty cool. We've created the first Deep Cuts comic book. Mystery Treehouse number one is a real thing. It exists. We've made it, and it's out now for you to get. But here's the really exciting thing. It's not just a comic book. We have actually done, as far as I've been able to find on the internet... One of the only comic album hybrids. We have done an original full color five page mystery treehouse comic book starring Andrew, Dave, Hillsmer, Zero, and a bunch of death metal zombies. And we have put it out together with the entire Napster musical on a cassette tape. This is a beautiful dual comic and album release with really cool packaging. And like I said before, a full comic book. The comic was written by Andrew and drawn and colored by Brandon Nebbit with cover colors by Shannon Willett. And the album, of course, was written, produced, and performed by Dave and Andrew. And it is a nine-song pop-punk odyssey about the rise and fall of Napster. Now, if you're somebody who collects and listens to indie cassette releases, this is going to go great with your collection. This is a really good-looking cassette release. But if you don't have a tape player, you have no reason to play a tape, think of this as a mystery treehouse deep cuts comic with some really elaborate packaging something cool that you can set on your shelf it's going to look really nice amongst all the rest of your comics and it's going to be a really unique thing that you can have and 12.99 is a great price for a comic alone let alone this cool little art project 
that is at once a comic and also this neat little packaging that has a tape that has the Napster musical on it. And also, if you have no way to play the tape, it has a QR code on it. You scan the code and it gives you the digital album, the digital comic, as well as additional music that's not on the album. There's an unreleased episode of Deep Cuts on there. There is a track-by-track commentary about the album where we go through the songwriting process and the story in each song. There's a ton of content this $12.99 gets you. And the comic looks amazing. The art that Brandon did is just mind-blowing, and you're really going to love seeing Andrew, Dave, and Hillsmer and Zero in this comic book world. The comic is basically about there's a death metal concert that's happening in front of the Mystery Tree House with all of the neighborhood showing up to listen and the band is playing and somehow they get a hold of the Squampanomicon and they accidentally cast a spell that turns the entire audience into zombies and then Dave, Hillsmer, Andrew and Zero have to fight their way out of the zombies. It's a really cool story looks amazing and you should definitely get yourself a copy of it now you can pick one of these up for 12.99 by clicking the link in the show notes or by going to bitly.com slash simple code comic or you can just go to deep cuts pod and click on shop and it's there as well and if you want to check it out and actually get to see it there's a link in the show notes to a trailer that we made that's really cool and it shows off the tape both the outside as well as the comic or just go to bitly.com slash simple code trailer to see the trailer i would highly recommend you check out the actual video trailer because this thing looks really cool and I'm really excited about it and I really hope that you want to pick this up because it's awesome and I love it. Act 2. Do you think Pope Benedict wrote erotic poems? One of the enemies that Sang Yang made was the Mongol Khan, Le Sang, who had the title Dharma King, Protector of the Faith. He was enraged by the Sixth Dalai Lama's disregard for his religious duties, renunciation of his monastic duties, and for conduct unbecoming of a Dalai Lama. The Qing Emperor Kang Shi coordinated with Le Song to send in a small force into Tibet and assassinated the Tibetan Prime Minister Song Ye Gyatso, who served as regent to the Sixth Dalai Lama and concealment of the Fifth Dalai Lama. Le Song successfully captured Song Ye Gyatso and declared the Qing Emperor as a false incarnation. R.I.P. to a king. This dude, he kept that charade up for 15 years. He was that guy who was at the front desk just being like, ah, you just missed him. Oh, this is so awkward. I'm so sorry. Try again next time. He concocted that whole plan. He recognized that um, the body double did not have the piercing eyes of the real Dalai Lama. He found this guy, and for all of that, despite his genius, he was taken from us too soon. After the capture of the sixth Dalai Lama, Kang Shi issued an imperial decree giving Lasang control over Tibet as its governor. The Tibetan people were not happy that the country was under foreign rule and did not recognize their Mongol viceroy or any claim that Qing Emperor Kang Shi had over Tibet. Lasang attempted to persuade the Lamas to bless his actions against the sixth Dalai Lama, who refused. Chang'ing Gyatso was then transported to China and died on his journey to Beijing. It is widely believed that the Mongolians had him murdered. R.I.P. to another king. Bro, that dude, that dude died for some poetry. Yep. It's like it was like that scene at the end of De- The Departed, whenever um, Matt Damon comes into his his apartment and Mark Wahlberg is standing there with like the bags on his feet, holding the gun, and he's just like, "Okay," and then the movie ends. Um, spoiler alert, um, that he walks in and he sees like a, a, like a, Mo- a Mongolian assassin and he's just like, oh, just do me one favor before you kill me. Just tell the world one thing for me. Spread my word. Let it be my last message to everybody. All of my people I hate the Tate. I like to bait, but I'd prefer to relate with a toot on a date. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I'm just picturing it too as like like a Mongol warrior like from the movie Mulan, like with that that black and gray armor with a giant like scimitar, but he's still got the little baggies on his feet. <laughs> as if like forensic science existed. <laughs> He's just like, I can't let my, my, uh, the, the particles from my shoes get on the floor because then they'll trace it back to me. With the sixth Dalai Lama removed, he was placed with the Lama Nguang Yesh Gyatso, being formally declared as the true incarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama. The Panchen Lama oversaw his ordination and gave his blessing. 
The installation of the new quote-unquote real Sixth Dalai Lama was rejected by the Tibetan people who still saw Siangyang Gyatso as the successor to the Fifth Dalai Lama and would only call Yesh Gyatso by his birth name, Mr. Pekar Zingpa. The Qing emperor recognized Yesh Gyatso on the 10th of April in 1710 to force the Tibetan population to accept Qing and Mongolian rule over Tibet. So they were like, listen guys, we got, we got new coke. And they were just like, fuck new coke. It's all about Coca-Cola classic. Bring bring the 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 true fifth Tang Yang back. <laughs> it's like, but this one this one doesn't have any sugar. Look, it's got Coke Zero, man. It's got no it's got no no sugar in this one. Nah, fuck that shit. Fuck that shit. Bring the old one back. We don't care if it's got sugar. It tastes better. And he wrote some dope ass poetry. <laughs> Fun fact, um, the, the, the recipe for diet Coke is a, sh- is a sugar free or a diet version of the new Coke recipe. And Coke Zero is a sugar free version of the recipe for Coca Cola Classic. I don't know the last time I've had Coke, but that is very interesting. Thank you. I, they, they had like <laughs> the, the thing that I love about this is like they literally retconned the story. They had, they had to retcon it. They were just like, uh, no, that was a fake one. He wasn't the real reincarnation. It was this guy. He was the real guy. We, that other, that was wrong. That was like Josh in accounting fucked up and like he, crunched some numbers wrong there was a spreadsheet that was all fucked up they they didn't the the pivot table wasn't like set up right and like somehow that guy ended up in here but like that's that wasn't the guy this is the guy we we fixed the spreadsheet and it's very clear this is the guy and the tibetan people were like sounds sus bro yeah the tibetan people were like i don't know i like his poetry that shit was juicy I don't know. I mean, he made some good points about relating. Yeah. The Lamas continued their search for the sixth Dalai Lama's reincarnation and announced in 1708 a boy who later became Kelzang Gyatso as the reincarnation of the sixth Dalai Lama. Once discovered by the Lamas, he was hidden in a monastery that was not under control of the Mongolian Khanate. In 1717, Tibet was invaded by a different Mongolian Khanate, the Dzungars, who murdered Hosang and deposed Yesh Gyatso. Yesh was imprisoned in a medical college. While initially the Tibetan people supported the Dzungar in overthrowing Lasang and removing the false Dalai Lama, that support quickly evaporated after the Zungar's occupying forces spent years raping and pillaging throughout Tibet. Man, that's some shit right there. You're just like, ah, oh, sick. These other dudes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They're coming in here. They're getting this whack ass Dalai Lama out of here. This guy doesn't even write fucking poetry. He's not even erotic in the least. Hell yeah. This new dude fucking. Dude. This dude is fucking lame. I would not like to sit down and have a beer with him. Dude, fucking Sanyang Gyatso is kind of a bush of the Dalai Lamas, too, because he's like, I'm relatable, man. I just like get my balls sucked. Yep. Yeah. And, then, and that was they were like, they were just like, yeah, this this new dude, he's this dude's he's got Biden energy. Like nobody wants to hang out with this guy. Like, get him out of here. And and Sanyang Gyatso, not a war criminal. So that was cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and they were like, oh, so you guys, you guys are down with the Sang Yang as well. You guys, you guys hate the Tate, but love to bait. And they're like, hell yeah, motherfucker. We, we bait, but we're going to relate with your people and we're going to horribly brutalize you for years. So, uh, yeah, this didn't, this didn't work out the way you thought it would. The Zungar's occupation lasted until 1720 when the Qing Empire sent a military force to remove their presence from Tibet and declared Tibet a protectorate under the Qing control. Afterwards, Kelzang Gyatso was installed as the seventh Dalai Lama on October 15th, 1720. So what happened to the false Dalai Lama? Reports say he was likely deported to China and died in 1725. It is not known how he died or where he died. There were rumors that his reincarnation was found in a Tibetan province, but the child died of smallpox and no further reincarnations were reported. Oh yeah, we found his reincarnation. Oh, never mind, never mind. False alarm. He's dead. Oh man, man. Oh, this was this was such an easy reincarnation. God, it took us 14 years last time. This one was only six months. Look at this little kid. He's so cute. Wait, why is he coughing like that? Ugh. God, God damn it. God damn it. This little fucking kid is so weak. This fucking bitch just died. Come on, man. All right, get out the mirrored sunglasses and the lampshade and let's fucking do this shit again. <laughs> Everything it again. It's Dolly Mama. <laughs> that, that's like the 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 season six of Scrubs where they like retooled the show 
and it just it became about like the college yeah co- scrubs med school season nine and everyone, and people just did not like it they're just like yeah i i didn't care for the season whenever jerry o'connell left and so they like made up the storyline where he slid into another dimension, but then his soul went into a different alternate dimension version of himself that looked different. And then, uh, and then, um, Rembrandt became the leader and like Rembrandt was like my favorite character, but for some reason he doesn't work as the, he as the leader. So it just like the show just was off balance and yeah, it just wasn't, a, it wasn't a great last season. Skip it, dead, it, but Jerry O'Connell is the best Dalai Lama. <laughs> Thanks to the short and turbulent reign of the six Dalai Lama, there was a lasting impact on Tibet that is still being felt today. The Qing Empire declared Tibet a protectorate under the Chinese Empire and began placing officials, ambans, to serve as Qing representatives in the Tibetan court. When the seventh Dalai Lama was exiled from Lhasa for his family holding anti-Qing sentiment, the Qing government installed the Panchen Lama as co-ruler of Tibet along with the Amban. And uh, Amban is Manchu for minister. For the Qing dynasty, if Tibet was stable, they had little interest in what was occurring within the kingdom, which led to minimal imperial and military presence. Once the Qing Empire placed Tibet as a protectorate state under Imperial China's domain, the Chinese government has used that as part of their continued justification for sole domain over the domestic political situation within Tibet, and that Tibet was never an independent nation. It was all a ripple effect from this sex-crazed poet Dalai Lama. When it came to Western powers and their support for Tibet in the 19th and 20th century, Great Britain was more concerned about winning, quote, the great game against Imperial Russia ensuring Tibet would align itself with the United Kingdom. Great Britain signed the 1904 Lhasa Convention to establish direct negotiations with Tibet and gain a, quote, more favored nation, first before Imperial Russia granted similar economic trading status. The Qing dynasty rebuffed the Lhasa Convention, viewing this as Western powers interfering with sovereign territory of the Chinese government, not an independent nation. Oddly prescient. The Qing government demanded change to the agreement and afterwards the Anglo-Chinese Convention of 1906 was signed, in which Great Britain agreed to not annex Tibet, interfere with the administration of Tibet, and uphold China's right to prevent foreign interference in Tibet. It's just wonderful. It's just wonderful how just these huge nations of, of people are just, they're just tossed around at the whims of these wealthy oligarchs and, and, uh, powerful political figures we're just all we're all just pawns at the 1907 Lhasa convention treaty aka simla convention between Qing dynasty great britain and imperial russia concluded with the following statement in regards to tibet the two powers agree to abstain from all interference in its internal affairs but to deal with Lhasa through china this treaty gave china carte blanche authority to oversee tibetan affairs without the interference of the west the question of tibetan independence was not raised again until the 1922 washington conference The United States stated that it, quote, assured the Chinese that the United States recognized Chinese sovereignty over Tibet. With this declaration, this meant that the United States was recognizing China's sovereignty and not suzerainty over Tibet, which ran afoul of the longstanding agreements within the international community. Great Britain treated Tibet as a de facto autonomous state. Yeah, and so suzerainty is the relationship in which one state controls the foreign policy and relations of a tribute state but still allows the tributary state a degree of self-rule. Um, so as opposed to just fully controlling and occupying the the nation, they allow them to have some aut- autonomy. That's a, that's a suzerainty. In the 1920s, the 13th Dalai Lama attempted to modernize Tibet, modeling the changes after Great Britain, as he would not rely upon any foreign power to protect Tibetan sovereignty. In order to finance the changes, this would require significant taxation on both the people and the monasteries. Monasteries throughout Tibet saw this as an affront to their traditional autonomy from the state. The Panchen Lama rebelled against the Dalai Lama as his areas were going to be taxed and decided to exile himself to Mongolia to avoid paying the taxes. The Chinese government capitalized on this division and welcomed him to serve in exile in Beijing. Man, huge religious organizations just hate taxes. They're like, fuck taxes. The only two things that will survive the apocalypse are cockroaches and me hating taxes. Before the 13th Dalai Lama died in 1933, he gave a prophetic prediction that some have interpreted to predict Mao's cultural revolution's impact on Tibet. Very soon in this land, with harmonious blend of religion and politics, 
Deceptive acts may occur from without and within. At that time, if we do not dare to protect our territory, our spiritual personalities, including the victorious father and son, the Dalai Lama and Panchen Lama, may be exterminated without trace. The property and authority of our Lakangs, residences of reincarnated Lamas, and monks may be taken away. Moreover, our political system, developed by the three great Dharma kings, will vanish without anything remaining. The property of all people, high and low, will be seized, and the people will be forced to become slaves. All living beings will have to endure endless days of suffering and will be stricken with fear. Such a time will come. During the Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong called for the total destruction of the old ideas that were seen as holding China back. Old ideology like Confucianism, Buddhism, etc. Those who opposed this policy were seen as class enemies. To carry out Mao's orders, Mao called to the youth of China, the Red Guards, to destroy the enemies of socialism and purge the Chinese Communist Party of internal corruption. For the Tibetan people, this would mean a total destruction of their way of life, religion, and cultural identity to ensure they were made to fit Mao's socialist ideal. The Red Guards held mass executions, engaged in torture on an unprecedented scale, and rampaged throughout the countryside, destroying monasteries, forcing monks to urinate on sacred texts, scrawling graffiti on walls of temples and monasteries, and subjecting religious and political leaders, even those who collaborated with the Chinese, to a struggle session. One struggle session was described like this. These struggles were diabolically cruel criticisms, meetings where children were made to accuse their parents of imaginary crimes, where farmers were made to denounce and beat up landlords, where pupils were made to degrade their teachers, where every shred of dignity in a person was torn into pieces by his people, his children, and his loved ones. Goddamn, that's dark. That's real dark. During the Cultural Revolution, the Red Guards damaged 100% of the monasteries across Tibet. 99% were destroyed completely, only 7 to eight remained. Tibetans were forbidden from practicing their religion and forced to burn their holy texts. They were provided in return a copy of Mao's thoughts. Despite the Red Guard's attempts to fully eradicate Buddhism in Tibet, it simply just drove it underground. There was the deliberate campaign to breed Tibetans out of Tibet and ensure Tibetan women were married to ethnic Han Chinese men and vice versa. These were only some of the first stages of Han colonization set forth by the Chinese government. The historic Tibetan governmental and religious infrastructure was totally eradicated by the Chinese government. Within the eight monasteries that survived the Cultural Revolution, a thousand monks remained. The political and cultural elite were either co-opted, killed, or forced into exile. All examples of Tibetan culture, architecture, and art were destroyed and made homogenous to fit the communist proletarian style. Panchen Lama and the Dalai Lama have a complicated legacy, as the surviving religious figure is supposed to be the authenticator of the deceased reincarnation. The Panchen Lama is to serve as the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people if the Dalai Lama has died. As you have seen, the Chinese government has historically used the Panchen Lama to divide and control the Tibetan people. When the current Dalai Lama, the 14th, fled to India with the Chinese invasion of Tibet in the 1950s, the Panchen Lama was made to publicly express support for the benefits of China's, quote, democratic reforms in Tibet. Privately, he expressed reservations to Mao known as the, quote, 70,000 character report. In that report, he discussed his reservations over the indiscriminate arresting of Tibetans after the Lhasa revolt and the atrocities committed by his people. Mao saw the Panchen Lama as a, quote, rock on the road to socialism and had to either be fully honified or eliminated as a threat. Mao also called the letter from the Panchen Lama a, quote, poisoned arrow at the party by reactionary feudal overlords. The Chinese government asked the Panchen Lama to denounce the Dalai Lama and assume his responsibilities, but the Panchen Lama refused. The Chinese government declared him an enemy of the Tibetan people, stripped of all posts, arrested and imprisoned from 1964 to 1974. He was released and put under house arrest until 1982. In 1979, he married a Han Chinese woman and they had a daughter. In 1989, the 10th Panchen Lama died at the age of 51 after giving a speech criticizing the Cultural Revolution's impact on Tibet. The Dalai Lama named Gendon Cheki Nima as the 11th Panchen Lama on May 14th of 1995. After his naming, the Panchen Lama was kidnapped by the Chinese authorities and has not been seen since May 17th of 1995. Chinese authorities announced that the real Panchen Lama was Yang Kain Norbu, so they're, they're still retconning. Still all about them cons. But not the not the other cons. They're Oh yeah, not not K H A N. Very against those cons. Yeah, very against those cons. Oh my god, but wait, 
are are the Chinese government's retcons spelled retcons as opposed to comics where it's retcons c o n and that's where the term comes from and that's why it's using comics <laughs> everything everything it's all it's it's the fucking it's all coming together we're figuring it out <laughs> <laughs> The end of this is the end of this is like, and then the Chinese government decided that they were going to wear a giant gauntlet. And when they snapped their fingers, half of all life would be eradicated from the world. (laughs) The Tibetans do not recognize Norbu as the Panjian Lama, much like the parallel with the imposter six Dalai Lama installed by the Mongolians and Qing Empire in the 1700s. The current whereabouts of the Panjian Lama is not known. It is likely the 11th Panchen Lama could be dead or has been put into a political re-education camp with no idea of who he really is. The Chinese government also claim authority to determine the Dalai Lama's reincarnation when he dies. The situation is looking to turn into a scenario where the Chinese government, who has control over the Panchen Lama too, will claim an individual as the Dalai Lama, while the Tibetan exile population in India will have their own Dalai Lama. The 14th Dalai Lama has stated that he could come back as a woman or cease his reincarnation. Only the future will tell how Tibetan Buddhism will manage the inevitable installments of dual Dalai Lamas and evolve after the death of the 14th Dalai Lama. No one would have guessed the impact of the 20-year-old monk in the 18th century renouncing his vows and religious titles to pursue a career of writing erotic poetry, performing karaoke, and visiting brothels, and how that would lay seeds to fracturing his country and religion. But that was the impact of the sixth Dalai Lama, a short but profoundly consequential legacy. And the and the, the moral here, much like any classic slasher film, is if you're out there baiting or dating or relating, it's nothing but trouble. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. You're going to die. Everything's going to go wrong. You got to stay pure because if you're baiting, dating or relating, it's going to have it's going to have consequences for hundreds of years. And it's going to lead to horrible imperialist political dynamics in modern day where people are being uh, brutalized and kidnapped and secreted away to never be seen from again. And um, uh, but at least we get two Dalai Lamas. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm really looking forward to uh the global instability hardships and uh, emotional trauma that's going to be inflicted um and also uh two dudes advocating for meditation but the really cool thing is the funny thing about it is that like normally it wouldn't be this way but when we have two Dalai Lamas you're just walking around and you know as you're talking to somebody and you're just like yeah you know the Dalai Lama was saying the other day and then they'll be like which one oh yeah it'll be like a it'll be like a uh, a, like a hot button political issue. You'll be like, you know, which which is your Dalai Lama? What do you mean by Dalai Lama? Are you are you talking about the Dalai Lama? Yeah, I'm talking about the Dalai Lama. Yeah, but are you talking about the, the real Dalai Lama? Yes, definitely. Are you talking about the Dalai Lama or the Dalai Lama? I thought you I thought you were overcome by spir- spiritual energy and you were going to be reincarnated in front of me. No, it was a fucking cockroach that ran across the floor that I got up to try and squash, but he I mean, you should be careful because you can get reincarnated as a cockroach, and that could be you. Every day you bound when I skip it down. Welcome to Davy as a cockroach. The only, the only, the only thing I have to say, the only words of wisdom I can say is, I hate Tatin. I like baiting. I'd rather be relating with a toot that I'm dating. I'm Dave Baker, and I'm Spandrew Spice. This has been Deep Cuts. You can find me online at heydavebaker.com. Spand you, where can people find you? I mean, you know what I'm gonna say. You know what I'm gonna say. I'm I'm do you can find me. You can find me not tatin, maybe baiting, but more likely relating with a toot that I'm dating. And you can also find me nowhere because I don't have social media. But if you want to pay respects to our dear beloved Papa Pricey, you can go to his website, DAPriceWrites.com, where you can get his comic, Deadbolt AI Private Eye. You can also follow us on social media, on Facebook, Deep Cuts Podcast. Join our Facebook group, the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group, where we talk about the show, episodes, we make memes, we t- laugh at memes, we uh, download memes and then repost them and pretend like we made them. We also talk about other stuff like movies and TV shows and stuff like that. Um, you can join our Discord server, bit.ly.com slash Deep Cuts Discord, where we do the same thing, except for more expanded. There's more channels. We're talking about all kinds of random, unrelated stuff to the show. Um, but we also make memes and stuff there. You can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. You can go to our website 
deepcutspod.com and you can get some merch by clicking on the shop or you can just go to bitly.com slash deepcutsmerch where there's t-shirts with our designs on them and other things such as hats and fanny packs and you can uh, go to the official Mystery Treehouse Toot Brothel which will be opening in Silver Lake in June. This episode, The Drunken Dalai Lama, was written by special guest writer Nick Miller. Expect more Deep Cuts episodes written by Nick and other guest writers. And if you have a penchant for fascinating true stories and deep research and are interested in writing for the show, email us at andrew at boygeniusmedia.com. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group, Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content. The incidental music for this episode was created by D. Catalano, whose music can be found at wekeepoddhours.bandcamp.com.